David is playing the good cop, and I will play the bad cop. <laughs> and urge uh, everyone to return to their seats so that we can get on with round two of our exciting adventure today. Spurred on by um, I th what I thought was a, a terrific close to the first session. And I see that there are some reinforcements in the room. John Temin has joined us. Good, is everybody here? Almost. Good. I'll turn it back over to David. Okay. So we're going to now turn our <coughs> discussion in a more political direction. We're going to look at a political scenario, but first we'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the political factors at play and uh, try to stretch our thinking a little bit about what kind of tools may be available to us. Before we do that, let's answer how many questions, Claire? Three? Four? Three. So let's just do three quick questions, get everybody's brains working again after multiple sandwiches. What is the largest political driver of extremism? Failure to create representative governments, persistent ethnic tensions, concentration of political ha power in the hands of the few, corruption or other? <laughs> well, all of the above, of course, are there, but the question is, what is the largest? 42% say concentration of political power in the hands of few. Um, and 6% say other. Who said other here? Why did you say other? Well, it may not be the most important, but I think we're going to neglect religion to our disadvantage here today. I mean, religion is such a central factor in this. I can talk more about it later, but I think the religious factors have to be considered. Okay, very important. Yes. I was going to say along those lines, a um, utopian uh, ideological worldview. In, in ter you mean in terms of these guys, in terms of the Boko Haram? Yeah. 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 Yes. You've just got to speak closer to the, the microphone. The fragmentation of the ulama, the competition between sects, the funding of, of different sects by foreign universities like the International Islamic University of Medina has created enormous competition among uh, different religious leaders that eventually spawned Muhammad Yusuf. Okay, interesting. There's a comment here from the audience. Poverty and uh, economic exclusion. Okay, thank you very much. One more? Where, from where? Here, uh, to your right, sir. To your other right. United States. Uh, oh, the United States, yeah, I'm sorry. There's, you know, there's people all over and I have, okay. you know. I, I would put just an incompetent government of which corruption is just one part of the incompetent government. Oh, okay, excellent point, excellent point. Next question. What international bodies can play the largest role in helping to establish effective governance that, con uh, that combats extremism? International NGOs, the UN, donor governments, international financial institutions, or other? I mean, clearly some work must be done domestically, but what, might, what international organizations? Okay, so international NGOs lead the way with a tie between donor governments and international financial institutions. Who said other? Why'd you say other? Uh, none of them, in my experience, are going to do anything to really help a government uh, in the short term uh, deal with an extremist threat. Is there some international mechanism that can? Uh, the coalitions led by the United States, uh, however risky that might be, have done some good. Okay. Good. Um, 
I would use the word coalition lightly, but of civil society organizations that are brought together. Lane, Sorry, uh, civil society organizations that are brought together by international bodies to communicate amongst each other. Okay, friends. I, I didn't like the concept donor governments because Nigeria doesn't need a lot of money. Uh, governments that are influential for political and other reasons may have more influence, but I don't like the. Okay, donor. that's an important distinction, Sarah. Did you want to say something? I was going to say the same thing, and I was going to say you're not going to like it, but I, I don't think any of this matters so much in that more than most other countries where we work, that Nigeria is insular. Okay. I, I, say, I, I, I have no objection to that. I was going to say OIC. Yeah, the OIC is more important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Michael? I was going to say as a corollary to Ambassador Jeffrey that I, I come down on the side of donor governments, but I would expand it in the way that Ambassador Lyman said. And uh, my view is that there are things that they can do to hinder the establishment of effective governance. So sometimes it's about what you don't do as opposed to what you do. Okay, next question. What is the most effective tool the international community has to push for political reform? Governance training, policy-based loans, democracy promotion, support for local NGOs, pressure from the international business community, other? Four. 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 Be overwhelming. I'm kind of thinking it'll be about 100% other here. No, it's not. Um, so 41% of you say support for local NGOs focused on government accountability leads the way. Next, pressure from the international business community and other. Is that you too? No? Somebody else? Other? 10% of you said other, and no one's owning up to it. Okay. Did you want to say something? There's a microphone. There has to be a microphone near you to say something. Right over here. This gentleman, you just walked past him. No, behind you. There you go. Briefly. Microphone's not on. Hello? Okay, very briefly, please. Um, I think one good way is uh, e examples that other nations can give. Like, like I would say, if the United States today joined the BRICS nations in promoting economic development in Africa or in Asia, that can set an example of how to transform relations among governments for other places. Okay. Thank you. All right. So. These are some, some ideas, some views on the political. Before we get into the views on the political, I'd like to just turn to two people quickly who have, you know, in listening to the morning, had some ideas on how we can tackle these things that I think will be helpful. And the first is Maksud. Thank you. Um, <coughs> basically, I had some systematic reflections that I thought I wanted to share with all of you regarding the ethos of peace game and the dynamics of the interaction today in the morning. Um, b basically, the way I perceive the dynamic that should be uh, in the way that I think should many ways guide the interaction in the, in the, in the next segment of the afternoon is, is basically to look at abilities of generating immediate yet short-term solutions that need to be both creative but also unorthodox. The, comfortable situation where we go with long-term solutions or maybe generating some abstraction of some sort is an easy exercise. Uh, we were all acquainted with mainstream political theory and thinking where it's all about political realism and being too cynical, maybe. But what we maybe need to encourage is having more of a paradigm shift, looking at the challenge, which is we have a situation at the moment on the ground. We need to come up with solutions. These solutions need to be short-term, immediate, and the catch is that we have no time to maybe think in long-term ways. This is maybe not very productive and maybe not ideal, but nonetheless, that's the uh, main challenge of the peace game, is how to strategize and work towards this direction. The other thing is I want to encourage all of you to think as peace strategists. 
basically having some sort of a peace toolkit, different diplomatic ways, economic means, alternative approaches than actually just referring to military approaches or ways of doing this. So that paradigm shift is important for us to be able to look at the different ideas or solutions needed in this regard. Thank you. Thanks. And I, th you know, I just want to underscore, again, our focus here is to get outside of the box of simply straight line extrapolation of what's happened in the past. And, and that requires us to be a little bit creative and for you to be, not to be slave to the role you're playing, but to actually take command of the role you're playing and say within these parameters what's possible as opposed to what has been done. Michael, you had a couple of thoughts. Thank you, David. Um, Princeton and Johnny and others here have, have taken part in these, uh, but we're sitting around this table and discussing things as, as track one participants, and so the responses we have are in that vein. And going along the lines that Maksud just mentioned, I think if we think ourselves perhaps closer to a 1.5 or a track two, where there are the opportunities for confidence building measures identified early, unorthodox recommendations, so there's a creativity that comes out of it. Uh, I think that might help the conversation. Good. I think both of them used the term unorthodox, and um, I, I, you know, I, I just, I just want to un underscore that. Now, what we want to do here is, for the next uh, little bit. Um, uh, set the stage for political discussion. Um, talk a little bit about what the political drivers of radicalization and extremism are. You can talk about it in the context of Nigeria, you can talk about it in a broader context. But what we want to do also is talk about them in a way where even as we're commenting on what are the drivers today, we're, we, 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 we turn, we turn our, our, our attention as quickly as possible to how can we address these drivers, produce positive change? Where can we find ideas in all of this? Um, so as I, I asked, you know, the, 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 the initial group of people that we had asked to kick this thing off, um, you know, the, the first question are, what do you see the drivers? But I want to quickly go beyond that. Uh, uh, John, let me, let me start with you. What do you see as the primary political drivers in Nigeria of the kind of extremism we're talking about? I think the political timing of this phenomenon, which has started earlier, but then 09 and then the jailbreak in 10 and so forth, maps almost, tracks almost completely with the electoral cycle. Uh, and if you have an election that tips expectations <coughs> in one way or another, uh, if it's not seen as free and fair, uh, you're going to have winners and losers, particularly for the presidency. Uh, and since that's where the money comes in, that's where the power is, that's where the military, the police, everything there, that's, that's the do-or-die uh, scenario. So the kind of the prime uh, impetus to, uh, to feeling disaffected, I think, uh, is uh, this question of uh, marginalization that can come from elections which are not seen as, uh, as free or fair. More recently, uh, when the military and the security people have gotten involved in trying to put this Boko Haram down, uh, they don't, the mass elite gap, you, they don't know what's going on the way the military is structured. Uh, they don't know what's going on at the grassroots, so civilians have to take over that uh, function. But the military have been, uh, and then even the intel people have been flying blind in the north and, and, and uh, uh, sort of the stomping here and there. And that has created, that has created the, the tsunami that we now see that was not there four years ago was not there 10 years ago at all. So th this question of kind of shining the light on the, the way in which the government has responded or not uh, is important. And I won't uh, belabor the change of government that's coming up here uh, very shortly, uh, but it is fair to say that the leader of the opposition was a folk hero, is a folk hero in the far north. Uh, and to, uh, to feel you've been robbed uh, in some way and that the courts are stacked and, and uh, is, is why we're really on the, on the, on the edge of something very serious. Uh, this is short, short term. Uh, we'll, we'll know by the end of next week who the candidates are, uh, and then we're in the race to see whether the election actually happens or not. But that, uh, I think that uh, 
the heavy-handedness in 09 when they when they rounded up these kids and then shot Muhammad Yusuf uh, and, and put put him in jail, killed 800 people, put him in jail, uh, and then the jailbreak, and then we've seen that thing snowball uh, ever since. So some kind of, this may take longer, but I heard the Europeans offer to do some uh, training on police. I think that would be very welcome. Uh, the EU takes this very seriously, and I know there are some real-world initiatives that are coming up in, in, in that di direction. But in terms of the short term, I think uh, the marginalization coming from elections at the national level uh, and then this heavy-handedness of military and security people. And I could also say there has been no effective counter-narrative. I'd like to come back to that point at, at okay. some point. Okay, good. And I think we should come to the, to the point of the counter-narrative because, again, that's the kind of area where there is a lot of opportunity for creativity, particularly in societies that have a lot of internet use, for example, where there's a lot of people plugged into new media, uh, reachable by a new means, and new narratives can take root via those new means. Martha. Well, and by the way, what I'd like everybody uh, to make a special effort in the next hour to lean closer to your microphones, because everybody has just consumed food and they're all inclined to drift off to sleep. So unless you're really close to your microphone, you're gonna lose them. Yeah, go ahead. Great, okay, I hope I'm close enough. Uh, probably most of you know that I'm a generalist and not a Nigeria specialist, and I'm an academic, and sort of from an academic, academic point of view, we would say that the So book now of, you've lost all credibility. Now I've lost all credibility. I'll have to restore it somehow. Uh, that the Boko Haram uh, insurgency or terrorism or outbreak or whatever we want to call it is, uh, it's in effect overdetermined, uh, to use academic jargon, in that there are so many causes. There's not one, there's not two, there's so many, and everything we've talked about feeds into it, which means that it's, uh, to say it's enormously complicated also leads one to lose credibility, but what it means is that in order to address it, you've got to come at it from different vectors at the same time, and those vectors have to be coordinated. And we talk about thinking holistically, but do we have any real ideas about how we could do this, the sorts of things we could do together? And so I agree completely with John, and I think the notion of looking not just at overall all these conditions that might lead to it, but the timing of the outbreak is critical to understanding what's going on. I also think that sort of the history of Boko Haram shows us a couple of things that are very important. Uh, one is that this is not a unitary entity here. We've been treating it this morning as though it were a something. And there is a something, but this is a very divided group. Uh, what, you, what we have now is splinters of splinters. I think those of you who are more familiar with the history will know that. And you had the founding father, in effect, who's killed by the security forces. All this is important to their mythology. Uh, also, I think it's important to, to remember that it's very much locally rooted. It arose in circumstances that are extremely propitious for the rise of this particular ideology. And many of you know these circumstances much better than I. Um, I think that the uh, government repression is also an extremely important issue. And uh, it crossed my mind that one of the reasons that I was invited might be a chapter that I've written for a recent USIP publication in which I concluded with uh, sort of uh, the bad example of Nigeria in which the security forces are strong enough to engender grievances by their brutality and their human rights abuses, not strong enough to completely crush the movement in the north. And so you're caught in this terrible dilemma of if, if they were weaker, the problem might not have been exacerbated so much. If they were stronger, the end might have been quicker but more brutal but now you're stuck in this in-between, and how do you change that sort of dynamic? So on that optimistic note, I'll stop. Well, let me, let me go back. I want to probe a little bit further if, with something that's going to come up again in the course of our discussion. You said we, we you know, can do this. We, we have to approach this on multiple levels. Who's we? I think the responsibility has to be primarily at the level of the Nigerian government. Uh, the government in Abuja as well as the governments uh, in the north. And I have to admit that this morning we were talking about what, what can the international community do. Uh, I don't see that there are a whole lot of things that we can do and we shouldn't think that we can leap into this and certainly in the short term. Uh, and I agree completely with John that until we know what's going to happen with regard to the elections, I, I, but I think we need to be prepared 
for what are the likely outcomes of the electoral process if they happen, if they're accompanied by violence, uh, who wins. And that will really be very important in determining what the international community and its different elements could do. And I'll just add to that, I was sort of, um, I wasn't surprised because it's very realistic, but when the minute there's violence against the, against the UN or against international NGOs, they pull out. We've seen this happen again and again. I understand the reasons why they do that, but the results are very unfortunate. Yeah, I think it, this question of who is we, who is the coalition, how do you do this, which by the way can vary on issue by issue within this sort of uh, 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 array of, 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 of ways that one has to address this political issue is, is vitally important. And I think a related question is, or there are two related questions that come to mind. What if the government that you feel has got primary responsibility isn't actually capable of doing that? Uh, the traditional response of the rest of the world is to shrug and to say, well then, there's not much that can be done. And you know, I think uh, one of the points of looking at extremism rather than any individual group is that this is a global trend. And there has to be a tipping point when people stop saying these are all isolated incidents that don't connect to one another. Because when you do look at them as isolated incidents, you don't feel an obligation to get involved. But if you see them as a pattern that extends from the west coast of Africa straight into Asia, then it has a strategic consequence, and it might create a motivation for governments or institutions to get involved with it. Um, and it, you know, this this is really you know this drives a lot of the discussion. And I just want to flag it here, so as we go forward, and we're we've got it in 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 in, in mind. Mohammed, you are the next in line. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, while we. Uh, continue to overemphasize the failure of uh, governance at the center for obvious reasons. Uh, we should not uh, uh, close our eyes to uh, complete failure of the other tiers of government, uh, particularly the states uh, in the north, as well as the local governments and uh, the cultural and traditional uh, institutions. Uh, in, before independence, uh, the cultural and traditional uh, institutions uh, played very key role in all aspects of governance. Uh, and uh, uh, when the uh, British uh, colonized northern Nigeria, uh, they did find that the level and quality of governance uh, was almost comparable uh, to what they had in other parts of the British Empire. Uh, hence the indirect rule of policy that they adopted in, uh, in, 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 in governing uh, uh, the Northern Protectorate uh, uh, then. Uh, but over the years, from independence to now, we have seen the erosion of authority, uh, the almost total collapse uh, of the emirate system as we move from parliamentary system of government uh, before the war, uh, civil war, and during the civil war, the creation of the states uh, by General Gowan in order to address some of the uh, issues of marginalization and development that we talked about earlier in the morning and uh, part, of, part of this afternoon. Uh, with the adoption of uh, the presidential system of government, uh, uh, the US model in 1979, uh, it, it was our hope uh, that uh, all these issues of marginalization that led to the civil war would have been addressed once and for all. Uh, people would have been given uh, platforms to uh, be inclusive, uh, both politically and uh, uh, economically. And in addition to the 36 state structure, we have 774 local governments uh, that were supposed to serve as platforms uh, for local uh, civil society uh, to participate uh, at, their, at their own levels. Uh, but what we have seen uh, is, in the north in particular, is the near collapse of administration, both at the local government levels and in some of the states, in most of the states, I would say, uh, with the exception of a few that you talked about. Kano, for example, stands out uh, uh, very clearly, uh, due largely to the leadership, to the current leadership in Kano, uh, that decided to make a difference. Uh, so. 
something has to be done. There, there, there's, there's a debate going on, and we saw in the national com confab that took place a couple of months ago whether we should set aside the American system and go back to the parliamentary system or whether we should adopt uh, the French uh, mixed bag. But be that as it may, uh, the issue, it's about leadership. It, 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 it's about uh, the quality of leadership, not only in Abuja, but also uh, in, in, in the states, as well as the local governments, and also the traditional institutions. Uh, the emergence of Sanusi in Kano as EMEA has uh, 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 excited some enthusiasm, especially among the youths that will probably uh, see a more dynamic, more modern, and effective uh, leadership at the traditional level. Uh, 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 they do not have uh, roles, official roles in the Constitution, in the American Constitution that we adopted. There have been calls for them to be given specific roles to give them authority in order to address some of these local issues. So uh, 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 I think we have to look at it from a holistic point of view. Uh, 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 I'm sure Professor Payden and Martha will agree that we, we have failed. Uh, it, it is what we are seeing, the dysfunctional system that is now producing uh, uh, insurgencies like Boko Haram is, uh, is a direct result of this failure at, at, our, at, our, at our own level. And uh, we welcome uh, this type of uh, uh, genuine round tables with experts who have other experiences in other parts of the world who would uh, 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 provide some input into how we'll be able to correct, correct, correct ourselves. Thank you. Well, I, th I think that's, that's a very important point, and it's really something I want to get into immediately in the context of this conversation. I'm going to turn to Chris next, and then we're going to open it up a little bit. But uh, you know, what is uh, an advantage in the context of this kind of discussion is looking at other places that have faced similar situations and have produced things that may have worked or may have at least had some lessons. And a number of you around the room have had experience in those places, and I want to turn to you next. But Chris, I would like to direct the same question to you in terms of what do you perceive as the most important economic drivers? I mean, excuse political. Me, political drivers. <laughs> Thanks, what he, David. What he said. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's very fascinating to be having these conversations um, on the eve of what could be uh, the, probably the most competitive political com uh, election that Nigeria has had in, in recent history. Um, and so I, with that in mind, I, I want to make sure that as we talk about the political drivers, we, we make a distinction between the origins or the direct causes of extremism and all of these political grievances which may exacerbate or or aggravate the situation without necessarily being the primary causes. And I think that point was raised very early on this morning in saying, yes, people can feel marginalized. There can be low levels of economic development. There can be a sense of lack of representation. But these issues, even in aggregate form, cumulatively, do not necessarily trigger extremism. There has to be a trigger moment. And then these um, issues can become enabling factors that provide the swamps in which extremism can thrive. Uh, with that said, I, I'll just make two comments to get us started. One is that I think one of the political drivers for me is the very centralized nature of the Nigerian state, which contrary to its constitutional provisions of being a federation, tends to centralize a, a lot of the power in Abuja. And so what this happened, what, what this means, and probably it's a legacy of the military rule which was very centralized, and in the situation where we see Nigeria constantly struggling to reestablish its federalism, uh, what this means is that grievances at the local level tend to be directed towards the centrality of power in Abuja. And so when people have grievances of lack of service delivery at the local level, they don't tend to look at the local government area uh, chairman or the state governors, they direct their grievances towards Abuja. And I think that's something that Nigeria is still struggling with. Uh, the second uh, political driver for me is, is how citizens in a democratizing society interpret 
political outcomes of competitive processes in which they are losers. And for me, the, this issue really came to the fore in 2010 and 2011, uh, first with the debate over the succession of the then vice president with the passing of the president, uh, which debate was even coming just three years after there had been the whole question about the term elongation with Obasanjo, uh, noting that the fight to respect, have the constitution respected, was led by then Vice President Atiku, who was also from the north, and then three years after that, Yera Dua from the north passes and Jonathan becomes the vice president. And I think the, 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 the manner in which that whole debate was, was driven within the domestic body politic of Nigeria uh, exacerbated some of the hard feelings within certain constituencies in the north. And so you fast forward to 2011, and we have what I still believe was a very credible election in 2011, a much better election than any of the other pre presidential elections Nigeria had experienced since 1999. And after the election results were announced, that a certain segment of, of society um, felt aggrieved by the outcome of those elections. And we saw what happened with the riots on over 800 people dead, mostly in northern cities. So I think that the way in which citizens interpret democratization processes um, has a lot to say in how they perceive whether they're part of the process and part of the game and therefore likely to benefit from some of these um, dividends of democratic governance or not. Um, that's why for me, uh, when you put up one of the very early questions, uh, I thought one of the ingredients to even the whole question of the political drivers is the level of citizen awareness and the level of education about what democratic governance is about and how the processes naturally uh, should work in favor of the entirety of the country as opposed to a few individuals. Okay, so you know, we can approach this on several levels. We can identify political drivers that contribute to extremism. And again, this is similar to the development discussion. Um, while building healthy, stable, high-functioning governments is an overall objective, our focus is more specifically on the conditions that promote extremism. Um, they're not completely separable, but, the, but it's more on that. So what are the things that drive that? Dysfunctional government, corruption in the government, lack of representation, disenfranchisement, uh, splits between the federal government, the local government, over-concentration of power in the center. There, there a number of things have been mentioned here. So those are drivers of, of uh, uh, the kind of conditions that might promote extremism. And then we can talk about what do we do about those things. And when we say we, of course, there are many different definitions. You know, is there some, you know, are there some things that have to be done internally by the Nigerian government, in which case, you know, do external actors who have an interest in seeing them do that um, uh, find a way to influence the Nigerian government? So that becomes the challenge. How do you influence the Nigerian government? In some cases, the Nigerian government may not be capable of doing it, in which case you say, are there other means other than the Nigerian government for affecting that. You know, one of them might be, you know, changing a narrative using social media, another might be using NGOs and training programs and so on and so forth. But what are the other tools that, that might do that? And among the questions associated with that are who are the right parties to advance those things? Because clearly if you have a movement that is skeptical of the West, and Western education, um, it, it, it may not be desirable to have a bunch of organizations that look, uh, sound, and act Western be at the forefront of that. Uh, if there's a debate about the true nature of Islam, in the, in the midst of it, perhaps it lends itself to having countries that have more experience with that be at the front of it. Um, and so, you know, we have a multi-tiered problem here. What are the drivers? What are the tools? Who are the actors best empowered to use those tools? And then what perhaps is a strategy for addressing those things? Do any of you from out, who have experiences outside of Nigeria that you feel are relevant in the context uh, of Nigeria? Go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a, it's a belabored, belabored uh, times the, the ISIS comparison, but there, I think there is a, a little bit of kernel of truth. You have a problem and you have a, a solution. The problem, all these drivers of governance and corruption and all of that, there is a, a, a ready-made, plausible solution. That's why I mentioned the utopian ideological worldview is the problem is this uh, Nigerian reality. There's a reality on the ground, people suffering, people being uh, marginalized, and you have hollowed out institutions. And then you have, the, there is a model. There is a model for resistance, for, for seeking some sort of justice. It's this very horrible, terrible, violent, uh, takfiri, salafi, jihadi model, which lends itself to these types of situations. So, you know, it, it kind of goes back to uh, uh, a guy who was n neither a Nigerian nor an Islamist who said, wrote a paper called, uh, wrote a book uh, called, What is to be done, right? Uh, as Lenin wrote, what is to be done about this problem? Well, th there is a solution in the eyes of these extremists to this thing. And it's not development and it's not uh, all these other things. It's a type of political violence for a just cause. Um, and this, this ties into the whole question of, uh, of counter-narratives. By the way, on that I would mention there's, some, I think, some really real-world important work being done by a um, cleric based in the United Arab Emirates, uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, with uh, Nigerian clerics, which is important to kind of build a counter-narrative. But, uh, but I would focus on that kind of the solution to the problem is a violent form of political Islam. I'd like to address the issue of tools in the who that you brought up. And I think that those of us who work in this rather new field of CVE or counter-violent extremism um, accept two basic principles about the practice. And one is that there is no cookie cutter policy, strategy, or tactic that works in every context, and it's completely different wherever you are and whatever the dynamics and drivers are. The second one is that the only viable CV solution has to be locally owned and has to be delivered by local incredible voices. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a role for outsiders and Westerners or NGOs or international players. And I think what's important to acknowledge is that there's an actual defined body of knowledge and skills tied to developing counter narratives, skills that can be taught and transferred, and then taken on the unique and contextual issues in any particular country. So I, I think of CVE as something that can be taught and transferred, and I think that's an important way to think about this kind of work. Pauline. Uh, yes, I'd just like to introduce a note of caution here. Um, as the, what we're really talking about here is a war on perceptions and shaping perceptions, whether we do it through economic or political tools. And there is a danger here that if we develop a strategy or a set of tools or initiatives that are defined only in terms of counterterrorism, it's a weak read on which to hang our policy in Nigeria because they will suspect that we'll go home real soon. Um, there are people that want to fight terrorism, but they, they, they are basically suffering under uh, the penalty of both a terrorist organization and a predatory government. It's a twin threat to the people in, who's living in Nigeria. Um, and unless we balance that in a way or shape the tools or policies that we do with a narrative that offers hope for the future, for Nigeria as a unitary entity, and we haven't talked about whether this actually will bring Nigeria up to the brink again and threaten the unity of the country. And that's, that's a real important thing because a lot of people will conclude that the way out here is the way out. That in fact they dissolve the, the, the country and, and every section of the country goes their own way. So I just think that, sh that defining it, I know we're doing it for U.S. interests in terms of counterterrorism and it, it's related to everything else that you laid out, David. But there is a danger here that if we confine ourselves simply to a strategy of counterterrorism without talking about the other threats that are there, it could backfire. Right. Well, and look, you know, we don't want to confine ourselves to something and thus make what we do ineffective. Right. right. We want to stick to things that are effective. Bronwyn. 
Um, I've done a great deal of work in Somalia, and in my opinion, one of the massive mistakes that was made in that conflict was the lumping in of a legitimate movement with the terrorist label. When we use words like extremism and terror, it lately. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. When we use words like extremism and terror to describe a group, we're attempting to delegitimize them. You know, Chris is used to the Congress, and everybody's shouting at each other all the time. It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think here, in the case of Boko Haram, it is undeniably true, A, that the Nigerian government has been a driver of the conflict, and B, that though there are indeed a lot of large problems that are pushing people into extremism, there are also small and specific drivers that can be addressed. For example, Boko Haram has said that it's kidnapped women and girls because the Nigerian government has arrested its own women, wives, and children. And there's no reason that the international community cannot push the Nigerian government to examine those claims and release any innocent women and children that it's holding. I'd also like to point out that when we have these easy remedies available to us, and we don't choose to act on them, we reinforce the idea that violence is an okay option because we are also not being reasonable. Okay, important point. Leanne. Um, one of the things that I think might uh, be useful for us to- This is you speaking as you, sorry. Are not in your capacity yeah. as Boko Haram. Not in my capacity as Boko Haram. Um, is to think about that um, Boko Haram is actually a, a somewhat of a fragmented organization, and so is the concept of government in Nigeria or in a lot of places. And if we think about them as solely of, you know, one to 15 personalities in Abuja that we're most familiar with, we're missing the fact that there's an entirety of a civil service that underpins a Nigerian state of 170 five million people. And so the concept of civil service might be something in this governance challenge that we come back to over and over again um, that actually the international community can have a little bit more influence on rather than just the personality-based influence of a couple at the top in Nigeria. And even though the security services for the most part are centralized and national there, you know, a lot of the other types of government players are actually local. And so, you know, I know USIP with bringing the governors here was, was part of this, but I think we can get even more local than that because what are the drivers of extremism is one question, but some of these things are actually just veneers. And if you just peel back the onion one layer, layer earlier, you're not, it's not actually those drivers that are these big political drivers. They're actually, you know, pretty localized. Factors. Well, that's a good point. We have a couple of folks here from Nigeria up in the, up in the stands here, and I just, I, you know, I'd love to get as many Nigerian voices as we could, particularly as we've been talking about this. Did, did you guys want to talk a little bit about how your, how what the perspective is from the local level as to what the drivers are, and uh, uh, particularly on the political side of this? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Florence from Nigeria, and a civil society, and from my own perspective. Uh, the political driver will say the selection process of our leaders is a real issue. And we see election as being fixed. We don't look at election being real in Nigeria. Being fixed that a leader must be there. And believe it or not, if this incoming election, Jonathan is not there again, Boko Haram will go then. We just die a natural death. That's the way we say it. And if it happens that power shifted to the north again, then another insurgence will happen at the southern level. So how do we place the divide? The solution will come from us. We know we are the shoes is pain, and we can do it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Did you, want, no, no, but, but did you want to say something as well? Later? Later, OK. Okay, um, all right, let's go down to Cliff. Let me just, um, from a journalistic point of view, I think one of the things I would want to do is ask Matt to write a long weekend takeout. <laughs> and among the things that I asked him to explore, and this gets back a little bit to what you were saying, David, are the, is the ideology of Boko Haram, how it is the same or different from the ideology of, say, al-Shabaab in Somalia, or Ansar al-Islam, uh, al and other uh, extremist groups in the, uh, in the Maghreb and Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Peninsula, and Al-Qaeda in, uh, in the Maghreb as well, hmm? as well. 
I'd ask him to look also at um, the threat of radicalization as a driver and the extent to which the Saudis, particularly, and the Iranians since 1979 may have spread that. 1979 was the Iranian Revolution. It was a galvanizing uh, moment uh, for uh, not just for, Sh for Shia, but also for Sunnis. You had the first modern nation dedicated openly to jihad. And that 1979 was also the year you had the, uh, the siege of, of Mecca, which we had ultra Wahhabis taking over uh, the most important um, capital of, of Islam. And that had a real impact on Saudi Arabia, and it wasn't a moderating impact. The Saudis had to get to the right of that in a certain extent. Um, and then I would also ask him to make sure he covers the extent to which what I would call the jihadist brand of extremism is anti-Westphalian. In other words, it, it is an attack on the whole concept of the nation state. And so it makes a lot of sense for Salafi jihadists to look at weak nation states, corrupt nation states, nation states where people don't have a strong sense of national identity, particularly if there are a lot of Muslims that you can recruit, and to go into those states and try to destroy them as a way to destroy the Westphalian system and more generally, and Western dominance as well. And maybe Matt wants to pick up uh, how he would uh, approach reporting that. So, sir, briefly, by the way, just, we're not playing a scenario here. You could just be mad if you want. What's I'm, that? I'm, I'm always mad. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it strikes me too that we're um, avoiding some, one of the most obvious things that Boko Haram is part of a global network uh, that's risen up in the last few years of a set of uh, affiliates of Al Qaeda. There is some evidence out there that they've trained with Al Qaeda in the Maghreb. So the um, you know taking into into mind all the pathologies of Nigeria, I can acknowledge them, but they apply to possibly the majority of countries, poverty, corruption, bad governance, and there must be, there, there probably is something else going on here, and I think we might want to raise that issue as well. Uh, yes, Johnny. Let me uh, uh, insert just a, a couple of uh, important historical facts and also uh, reiterate, uh, I think, uh, some of the uh, importance of a, of a few drivers that have been touched on. We all look back uh, at the origins of uh, Boko Haram to 2002, and the turning point uh, being 2009, uh, when Mohammed uh, Youssef uh, was killed. Uh, many have uh, portrayed uh, this current conflict uh, as one of uh, uh, Muslim antagonism towards uh, a uh, Christian-dominated, uh, southern-dominated government in Abuja. But many people fail to remember that when uh, the initial assaults were taken against uh, the, uh, the rise of Boko Haram, uh, the president was Mohammed Yara Adua, another Muslim leader. And that at the <laughs> outset of the most uh, intense and vicious parts of the upswing, we did not have uh, a, uh, a Christian Southern president in power. Uh, it was uh, the end of the Yaradua period. So this is, should be kept in, in, in mind. Which brings me to a point I think our colleague from uh, George Mason, both of our colleagues from George Mason have pointed out, but I would uh, put in a greater uh, high relief, uh, that some of the political drivers to this conflict uh, are indeed uh, a, a failure of local government, both traditional local government in the form of Islamic leadership uh, in the north, as well as modern government in the form of governors who have equally failed to deliver the goods to their societies, have failed to deliver good education, good health care, good infrastructure, and roads. And so you have that as a failure, a failure of both traditional government and a failure of modern government at play. The other key driver, which I think is, of course, not mentioned here as intensely, 
is the enormous uh, conflict between the center and the states uh, and the competition over control, power, and spoils, which also exacerbates uh, this, uh, this issue uh, to a great uh, extent. So I think that while clearly there are a number of reasons out there, we need to look very closely. I'd also say to our colleagues on the media side that if you look back in 202 to up to 209, 210, uh, this uh, is not a part of a global jihadist movement uh, in its origins. This is a local uh, 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 resentment uh, towards both traditional leaders uh, uh, in the church uh, or in the, uh, and the government uh, as much as anything else. Uh, I think that it is evolving and has progressively evolved uh, and uh, some of these linkages uh, in terms of copycatism are starting to form, uh, but we have to remember that a lot of these drivers, and go back to the economic issues as well, is that you uh, don't have to finance externally uh, Boko Haram uh, when Boko Haram or parts of Boko Haram are nothing but a criminal syndicate, robbing banks and post offices and carrying on uh, high-class kidnappings. There is enough money in that uh, that uh, precludes the need for outside resourcing. And so I think that we have to be careful about equating too many of the international linkages too soon. I think that they are emerging, uh, and they're certainly emerging in the form of copycatism, uh, but uh, we need to remember uh, that when all of this started to get nasty, there wasn't uh, Southern leadership uh, in power uh, in uh, Abuja. It was Muslim leadership, and the resentment uh, is strong there as well. I, th I think that's an important point. I, I, I do think, however, that, we, that, that one of the things that we've seen is groups that have arisen for different reasons morphing together or choosing to align themselves with broader movements because that empowers them in a variety of ways. Uh, and I can't help but think that listening to Johnny's description just now, uh, Jim, that it could have been a description of Iraq. Uh, and you were ambassador of Iraq, and I was wondering if you heard the same thing. Uh, very much. It started as a local uh, reaction to first Saddam and what he did, then uh, a almost inevitable resistance to any outside force coming in. And then, of course, as you know, this uh, variant of al-Qaeda that we associate with Zakawi and has now morphed into ISIS with its very particular uh, unique Shia-Sunni uh, dichotomy at its heart uh, rose up uh, first against us uh, that was its narrative, but after the Fallujah battle in uh, 2004, it directed itself far more against the Shia majority in the country in a struggle to try to provoke a regional uh, conflict, and uh, uh, it didn't succeed then. It's now back again, coming over the border from Syria, trying to do it again. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to find a conclusion from that that would apply to Boko Haram, because Boko Haram hasn't developed either a unique philosophy, as far as I can see, uh, that would provide uh, uh, its claim to jihadi uh, supremacy uh, in the, the region, uh, nor anything like the uh, capabilities of ISIS. But uh, the uh, problem that we had in dealing with uh, this, beyond all of the capability problems and the economic problems and the political problems and the ethnic problems you've had in Iraq was that it was an extremist ideology and a certain percent of the population would be attracted to it and would fight like hell to the death uh, to uh, try to expand it. And you have a similar phenomenon with these people and it's very, very hard to stop without a whole lot of brutality and a whole lot of resources. It, it also echoes very closely some things in Afghanistan. It echoes very closely some things in Libya. It, you know, you do have these commonalities across the board. 
Uh, yes, Sarah. So I want to specifically raise something that we've kind of been dancing around. For we've, got, we've just got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to go to each of you briefly, okay? Sure. Um, and that's the question of Nigeria's response, the Nigerian government's response to Boko Haram and, and specifically the human rights abuses that have occurred because after, you know, ideology and changing the narrative and then combating the political and economic marginalization, I think this is the third top issue to countering violent extremism. And not only because it's counterproductive, because we're actually further alienating populations um, by, you know, killing hundreds of civilians and, you know, um, disregarding due process, extrajudicial killings, you know, you name it. Um, but there's also no accountability. So we need to change the tactics and, you know, create a much more productive strategy with the Nigerian government. And secondly, there has to be some kind of accountability or you're never <coughs> going to get trust from those populations. Uh, no, y yes, over here. Um, I just want to counter this idea that uh, we're dealing with people who have very romantic ideas about the past. I think Islamism today is what communism was for a lot of people who are anti-colonial 50 or 60 years ago. You have a status quo that doesn't work, and these people come and realize that with this idea, I can recruit a lot of people who are very frustrated with the status quo. And so these people are not really interested in ideology so much. It's a conduit. The argument is really about power. And you look at people in North, uh, North Nigeria, or you look at people in a lot of places in, in the Arab world or in the Muslim world where we have failures. What the people who are coming here and trying to replace the status quo know is that there is a lack of consistency on the status quo in its commitment. How committed is the central government of Nigeria to Northern Nigerian uh, development and growth? Not so much. Can Boko Haram prove that it's going to be more con uh, committed to the, this region? It needs to do that, but it knows that time is on its side. It knows that if it does this enough, people will be like, okay, a couple of stonings a year, a couple of chops a year, but at least things are going to work and we're going to get investment and things are going to be consistent. This is the thing. What you're really fighting against is this very deep perception that local government, the state governments, the status quo, is not really committed to this region. It's just they want to snooze the region, they want to push back Boko Haram a little bit, make them weaker, and then just go away and come back to this. As long as people in those regions believe that, believe that the central government is not going to be in northern Nigeria for the long run, you're still going to continue to see a lot of success of Boko Haram in that region. And I think that's important. There's a very, very powerful point that needs to inform the way that we approach this scenario. Because if you accept the idea that what is motivating Boko Haram is deep-seated ideology, historical issues, religious issues that you know, are in people's DNA, then you'll treat it one way. If you view it as a political tool, uh, much as you, communism, which was a good example, um, which is not to say that people don't believe in elements of it, it's simply to say that they are using it for personal gains in terms of power, then your strategy isn't counter-ideological or counter-religious, it's just counter-political. It's a very different thing. Okay, looks like you really want to jump in, and then we're going to wrap this up. Be very, very short. So I just want to add one thing to the second half of what you just said, is if we're going to cast this in terms of power and political tools, we need to add the term identity to that as well, because that might be what the leaders of Boko Haram are seeking, but what's ha the people who are joining the group are those who are seeking an identity, and that's an important, yeah, important piece of it. Okay. Look, this, is, this has been a very useful discussion for framing the political debate. Um, and I think we've identified some drivers and I think we've identified some important questions that we've got to grapple with as we are going forward. I also hope that you took to heart the comments of Maksud and Michael about seeking uh, creative, unorthodox solutions to some of these problems as we go forward in the debate. I personally also took to heart the earlier comments about human rights abuses. Um, and with that in mind, although the program says we don't have a break here between now and the two hour uh, scenario. Um, I feel we should. Um, so get, I'm getting a lot of support. This could be identity issues, could be ideological issues, right. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with it um, uh, for self-interested reasons. Uh, so, so it's now uh, t about, about 10 of, can we reconvene here at 2 o'clock? Thanks. <laughs> Got to know it's important. <laughs> <laughs>